Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories. I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the American English Podcast. By now, you probably know how much I love connecting language and culture. To me, they go hand in hand. And that's why in today's episode, I've invited Charlie from the British English Podcast on the show to talk about Harry Potter. Yep, that's the topic. Today, we'll dive into the magical world of Harry Potter, but not simply the fictional side of it. Harry Potter, in many ways, was inspired by real places in the United Kingdom and aspects of British culture, from the school system to social structure and class. If I'm honest with you, even if you're not a Harry Potter fan, this episode might be eye-opening. We not only compare British English with American English, we compare life. It's not often I jump out of excitement while recording an episode. I did today. If you do love Harry Potter, get ready to have your mind blown. We'll start this episode by covering memories growing up with Harry Potter. Then we'll cover real aspects of British life in the books. To wrap it up, we'll tell you why we think you should read Harry Potter if you have an intermediate to advanced level in English. Are you ready? Let's do it. Hi, Charlie. Hello, Shana. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Good, good, good. The sun is shining. We've uh, we've had a few months of terrible weather in the UK, and finally we've been graced with some sunshine. So it feels like a huge shift. We've kind of gone from winter into summer straight away. It's lovely. Well, That's not amazing. lovely before, but yeah. <laughs> not lovely for the months and months of dark dark skies and cold, rainy weather, but it sounds like it's nice outside now, so time to take the dog on a walk, right? Yes, yes, we will be doing that after this recording, probably. Real quick question about the weather. In American English, we say April showers bring May flowers. Do you say that also? That's a nice phrase. I've not heard that before, so I'm going to guess that we don't say it, but don't quote me on that. Okay, so you don't um, have Mayflowers, or do you have Mayflowers? <laughs> we, yeah, we've got some Mayflowers. I just heard a new phrase. It's called No Mo May. No Mo May. And what, is, what does that mean? So it's to not cut the grass with your mower in May, because apparently this damages the life cycle of lots of plants and smaller animals and insects. So people are putting up little signs and saying, no mo may. So like when there's long grass, people are like, you need to cut your grass, mate. But if they're aware of it and they put that sign up, people are like, oh, okay, it's for the environment. Nice. It's a good excuse to be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Very true. That's very true. That's yeah. great. I am really excited to talk about the topic we have today. Me too. Harry Potter. I mean, I mentioned this to you and you said you are Harry Potter. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Are, did, you, did you go to Hogwarts? <laughs> I didn't go to Hogwarts. I went to the Howard of Effingham School. Now, I, um, I did think that, Harry, uh, that Hagrid would come and visit me every time I got in trouble with my parents. I, went to my, I was like, take, sent to my room and I thought Hagrid's going to come. One day Hagrid's going to come. And also, I am exactly the same age as Harry was when the books came out. Okay. So when is your birthday? Do you mind me asking? 1990. 1990. Okay. I was born December of 1988. And I also felt like he was right. We were right around the same time frame. So you turned 11 when he turned 11, right? Yeah. 
I'm pretty sure I was 11 when he was 11, when the book was published. Do you think that you were his age? No, I mean, actually think about it in terms of the year at school I read it and everybody in my class was starting to read it and going, we're going, we're going to grow up with Harry Potter. There are six more books after this one. And they were so excited about it. And there was still that sort of same idea of, hey, I'm going to get a letter from Hogwarts. It's my 11th birthday. I heard that so often, that excitement in people's voice talking about this topic. But that's interesting that you also were in England at this time, which is mind blowing. I feel like this is a bucket list conversation. Like I should have talked to someone years ago who was from England, grew up there and experienced this whole, I guess, the chaos that followed Harry Potter personally. Yeah, what you should have. Like? I, w- I was waiting for it for years. I think I was even, I even grew up near Little Whinging. Is that the area that his hometown, Little Whinging, something? Are you listening to the audiobook right now or are you reading the book? Because you're in the first one, right? What, right now? So, yes, long story short, I am. I would like to announce to your listeners that I don't just listen to Harry Potter on repeat forever, but I did grow up listening to the audio tapes and then two months ago I thought I'm just gonna see what it's like as an adult now so I'm on book five yes book five but I'm listening to the audio and it's by Stephen Fry I don't know if you listened to the audio books I listened to them in I think in German and in Portuguese so wow that's cool yeah good language practice so yes yeah we'll be talking about that later on but I definitely think for the pronunciation of things, you were just looking up little, it kind of helps with the pronunciation. I can't remember the correct pronunciation. And if I read it, maybe the correct British pronunciation would be different from. Yeah, little whinging. W H I N G I N G. And it is a fictitious town. So it's, it's not real, but it's based on a place called Surrey, which is the county that I was growing up in. Yeah, I felt like I was basically Harry. Plus, plus, I've got a scar where Harry has a scar. <gasps> Does it look like a lightning bolt? Um, I'm not going to say yes or no to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, okay, so you, you grew up in an area, I mean, obviously the country where the book was written. It was inspired from an area you're from. What was it like? maybe I should say, after the books were released? Was it just like your whole town, everybody running out going, yay, we're all going to read Harry Potter where we all feel so connected to this character? Like what was the aftermath of its release? There was a lot of, so there's a bookstore chain called Waterstones in England and lots of people would sleep over there the night that the book would be released. And I think J.K. Rowling even went to one of them each time. I may may be making that up, but I'd like to think that that's true. And she read it out to some of the children there. That would have been pretty epic. I didn't do any of the sleepovers at Waterstones. I was obsessed, but quite on a sort of individual journey. I had one friend in my school that shared the passion with me as much as me. And we geeked out about it watching the films together but yeah i don't know i think at 11 as a guy as a boy you're still a little bit aware of street cred i think i hid my passion of harry potter for most of my existence so it wasn't the cool thing to do no 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 i don't think so maybe for the first year or two but but afterwards you weren't walking around in a cloak and Nice no, my nephew right now, he's 11 and, he, and we took him to Harry Potter World last year and I enjoyed it probably more than him, but he bought a wand, which I thought was really cool, but I just couldn't justify buying <laughs> one. <laughs> oh. And he, go, he goes around the house with a cape on and, and uses his wand and I'm like, oh, I wish I was that young still. Oh, you could do maybe for Halloween, get yourself one and use that as an excuse maybe? that could be an excuse no I, I just I couldn't do that to myself so what is this Harry Potter world it's like a I would say it's like a, a movie studio theme park museum combo it's in 
Watford, I think, in London, just outside of London. Yeah, it's where the studios were for the films. And you get one particularly impressive moment. Actually, there's loads. I got to drink butter beer, for example. That was epic. Have you done that? I have bought a mini bottle of butter beer from the WB Studios in LA because they also have a mini Harry Potter section with a sorting hat. You can choose, they'll tell you what house you go into. And they have the area where you can buy, obviously, Birdie bots every flavored beans the chocolate frogs, the butter beer. And so I, I did try it. It's very sweet, isn't it? The yeah, beer? It's, it's, it's a bit too sweet, isn't it? I felt quite sick after the end of, at the end of my drink. Is that common in England, butter beer? Is that, is that something that you can actually order in a bar? Definitely not. Definitely, Definitely not. not. Okay, no. so that was created. Yeah. There's a beer called Butty Bach, I think. It's, I think it's Welsh. It's a, it's a nice ale. And it's, it kind of makes me think that I'm drinking a butter beer, but no, the, the drink is fictitious and it doesn't get distributed across the UK. You have to go to Watford, from what I know, to experience that. But I was going to say that there's a room where you get to see the actual Hogwarts castle, which is a model. I think you might know this as a Harry Potter geek, but the castle itself is a scaled down model. There, there's no such thing, right? Did you know that? No, no, no. No, I did oh, not okay, know that. Oh, okay, okay. I did not know that. No, the only thing I saw was, I can't remember, the Great Hall. Maybe you can answer this for me. But isn't the Great Hall based on something that actually, like an actual place that exists in Britain? Uh, that might be a Google. I don't know. I, I went through the Great Hall. It was a real, like, staged scene. So do they have floating lights and things? Like, yeah, the, the magic's the... real in those studios. Yeah, <laughs> yeah things just fly oh, and then yes, food of appears. Course. <laughs> I should have remembered this because Vanessa from Speak English with Vanessa, she went to Oxford and she told me about her experience. And yes, this is based on the Tudor Hall in Oxford in one of the um, canteens, I guess, that they have in their university. I like Christ that you use that word. Canteen yeah. for me is a little bit foreign it would be for us like a cafeteria like a school cafeteria sort of, oh okay like a, um, yeah we have a, a a close association or collocation with school and eating area being school canteen canteen interesting yeah. cool difference there all right so what were you going to say sorry to interrupt you um yeah the big castle is a scaled down model and you get to walk around it and you can see how they filmed it it's all very impressive how they green screen the background and like the dragon in that flying scene. But it's, yeah, it's all a scaled down model. Mad. Amazing. That's very, very cool. And have you been to any of the other locations? I know you, you mentioned, okay, so Surrey is, was sort of the inspiration for Little wind, Winging. And then the Great Hall, you now mentioned. What about Hogsmeade? I actually pulled something up from ChatGPT. Do you mind reading this for me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So is this the Harry Potter series is steeped in British culture? No. Down at the bottom. Yeah. So underneath inspiration from real places. There's five different places on my list that I found or six. Diagon Alley, platform nine and three quarters. And then Hogsmeade, which is this sort of, you know, where you would get the butter beer we just spoke about. The Forbidden Forest and the Ministry of Magic. Do you mind reading the Hogsmeade one? Yeah. Okay. All right, Hogsmeade. Hogsmeade, the only entirely wizarding village in Britain. This was inspired by the... Qu oh, sorry, in, in the story, yes. Uh, <laughs> I thought it meant in real life. So oh I need gosh. to go there. Um, so this was inspired by the quaint and picturesque villages found throughout the United Kingdom. Rowling envisioned Hogsmeade as a cosy, snow-covered village with winding streets and crooked buildings reminiscent of traditional English villages. Okay, so it's not a one place that she's imagining. She's kind of pulled it all together, right? Right. And I just was curious, these images for you, like the way it's described, did it sound very familiar? Because for me, like this is, I have to create these things in my mind, but you were in the place where these small, sort of small picturesque villages actually exist, right? Yeah, that's that's really interesting because 
I've lived in America and I can understand your point of view right now. And I'd never thought of that for, Amer- for an American person imagining these, these places. But for me, it, it feels quite normal. So it just fit into place perfectly. So it was, it was so believable, so realistic, the description. The way that she writes is incredible in its own right. But still, yeah, I was right there instantly. And if I was American and I was brought up in an, an area that was a bit more man-made, I might struggle with that. And so I can see your point of view totally. Yeah. It was a heightened level of imagination trying to picture what Hogsmeade looked like. And for me, it was, this is the most magical place <laughs> in the whole world. I want to go to Hogsmeade so bad. And I remember in the book, every single time they had their planning to go on the weekend, I would get so excited going like, yes, they're going to Hogsmeade. They get to have, you know, their outing. They're in their third year, whatever. Uh, to be fair, I, <laughs> I, I was excited too. Yeah. Okay. I can understand your excitement. But even is, the, so. um, is that the Cotswolds there that have that sort of vibe? Because that's kind of the parallel I made in my mind, I think. Well, after I was aware that those actually exist. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good challenges. comparison. The Cotswolds is very picturesque, rolling hills, quaint villages. Yeah, exactly that. And so there are so many different areas. I mean, platform nine and three quarters is at King's Cross Station, right? In, yes. Have you been there? I have. I've been to King's Cross Station. I think I go there quite regularly now, actually. And yeah, actually, the last time I went, there was a queue of people outside the the normal terminal. And I was just like, what? There's literally nothing stopping you from going in. And then I looked over the opposite side of the hallway and there was this gift shop of Harry Potter stuff. And there was a zigzagging queue outside that shop. And this extra queue was a backup queue for people to go into that next queue. So yeah, it's it's really got quite crazy how people want to go to King's Cross to experience this um, Harry Potter feeling. But I think there's also that uh, trolley. Yes, there's the trolley that's halfway through. Yes, that is another word that we say differently in English. So it's like a trolley. Well, I guess we say trolley sometimes. It sounds a little British for me. I would say a cart. A cart, yeah. I think shopping cart, but push. Yeah, tr- I think we call it a trolley. In in Harry Potter, did you hear trolley? It's or did trolley. You hear car- yeah, yeah. It's, it's trolley in British English for sure. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, nine and three quarters, there's that half push trolley or the cart in the, the actual pillar, right? So Actually, can- let, let me go back on that. It's shopping trolley. Yes. When I go to the supermarket, I always pick up the shopping trolley. Yes. Yeah, so King's Cross Station is another lo- Harry Potter location. We have the platform nine and three quarters in Diagon Alley. Apparently, from what I've read, it's there's Diagon Alley, the magical shopping street in London, was inspired by the narrow, winding streets of cities like London and Edinburgh. Edinburgh, or do you say Edinburgh? Edinburgh. 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 Yeah, Ooh. yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, it's, a, yeah, that's it's a one, one that uh, is a bit of a trap for non-natives. Just trying to think. So Diagon Alley, that was, that was actually the one that I got really excited about when they were going. I think the, the moment he got that Nimbus 2000 was an insane moment in my childhood. I couldn't believe that he got a... Oh, that was great. Actually, no, I'm, did he buy it? No, he didn't. He got gift, gifted it, didn't gifted he? Gifted it, yeah. Did he get gifted the Firebolt as well? That's a good question. I can't remember, but I know, no, I think, did Dumbledore give him the Nimbus? And then Sirius yeah. Black gave him one of yeah, them. Yeah, very sure, good. But. Very good. Yeah, he gave him, yeah, he, he said, consider it as like 15 present birthday presents or 12 birthday yeah. presents. Yeah. Oh gosh, your memory is good. <laughs> yeah, but he went to look at it. I remember him getting excited about that. Anyway, I'm so geeking funny. out so a bit y- pointlessly. No, but it's it's interesting though that in London they this is sort of modeled also of winding streets in London, mm-hmm. like which I yeah. was not aware of. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I there do are. sort of remember there are older streets there, right? In London, like kind of I mean, yeah, narrow alleyways and Yeah, it's an ancient city. I mean, 
Londinium. When was that founded? 47 AD. So, yeah, 2000 or so years old. But Edinburgh, I can imagine being more so even sort of windy streets. I haven't been. I want to go quite soon. But yeah, I can imagine she would have pulled from that city even more so. Okay. There are a few aspects of British culture that I think as an American just... I mean, it's foreign to me, and I, I'm curious to know, like, how real these things are. Do you mind actually reading the first in my list about the British schooling system? Yes. So Harry Potter is steeped in British culture, drawing upon various aspects that are familiar to those living in or familiar with the United Kingdom. Here are some real cultural aspects of British culture introduced in the Harry Potter series. Okay, so British schooling system. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry is modelled after British boarding schools, complete with houses, prefects, and a strict hierarchy of student leadership. The structure and traditions of Hogwarts, such as the sorting ceremony and house points system, reflect elements of the British schooling system. That is interesting because I've never thought of the fact that it might not be like that. So in America, the schooling system doesn't have prefects. I didn't even know what a prefect was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Percy, what is your job? <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> and I don't think I even had internet at the time. So I was like, okay, he's just, it sounds like it's something in charge. So yeah. prefect is a normal term you use. Did you think it was a typo of perfect? Yeah, Percy's perfect. Um, yeah, very, yeah, very normal. I wasn't a prefect, but... Quite a few of my friends were. We had head boy. Do you have head boy and head girl? No. Oh. Fascinating to me. Yeah. This is so interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we had had very similar system. We had house points. Do you could you win house points? Wait, so 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 can we can we go back a second? No, <laughs> no. So a boarding school for you. Is this mm-hmm. a school that your parents send you away to because they don't want care you for to- you? care for you and they want you to be reformed in some way no 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 no. boarding school is quite popular i think it's becoming slightly less over the last couple of decades but generally speaking it's more for affluent parents who can afford private school and send them away for boarding school boarding school is divided into week and weekend or weekday and yeah weekend boarding so some of them would just do the week and then come back for their weekend I went to a state school. My dad worked as a teacher at a private school. So I went to your everyday school and came back each day. So, yeah, my parents loved me. (laughs) Yes. But you don't have that connotation then with the word boarding school being sort of like send your kid away. like Slightly, slightly. But it's not probably what you said. No. Got you. Okay. So you you went on a regular basis and you had these houses inside of the school like what did you have a sorting hat to decide which house you would go in no it was it was actually a sorting sock so you put the sock on and then they would say the top four head of their department teachers would shout out Bromwell or Howard or Sheridan Raleigh kind of thing and then you would go to that house I, I can't tell if you're joking right now. I'm looking at your face, but like I can't. I'm not seeing any sarcastic <laughs> expression. Is um, no, no sock was included. No, no you sock were just is, okay. You were just given a form. <laughs> so our our year was split into four houses, and you had a different color for your house of your tie. Sorry, my tie was red, and that meant I was part of the Howard school uh, house. And so you would compete throughout the year. For your house, you would get house points for your house. And then on sports day, you would potentially get quite a few house points. So it's, again, it's like Quidditch. Exactly. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, so so you were, were you selected based on your characteristics, like your personality type? No, I don't think so. No, no. Yeah. Ma- ma- I mean, maybe some schools do do that kind of personality quiz, but I think that would be a bit unethical. Okay. If you had been in Harry Potter, which house would have been yours? I used to always say Gryffindor for the obvious reasons, but some cool kids have said, no, Ravenclaw is the one you want to be in. So I don't know. I mean, my wife would probably suggest that I should be in Hufflepuff, but 
I suppose that's, that's better than slither- slithering. <laughs> Did you just say that's not bad? <laughs> that's not bad. No, I, I, I feel like Hufflepuff, the sort of response is always like, oh, mm-hmm. you're just like the nice one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, oh, OK. Is that just the nice one? I thought Hufflepuff was a bit soft and pathetic. <laughs> oh, soft and pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> and nice and nice. I, I don't know. But it's it's funny, what though. I Well, according to the WB Studios, I put on the sorting hat and it said I was in Slytherin, but it doesn't know anything. Oh, it's not the real no. one. Um, Have you got a dark mark? <laughs> no, but my mom took a video of me and there was clear disappointment on my face after the sorting hat said I was in Slytherin, which is <laughs> sort of funny. I actually posted it on Instagram and I asked people, like, if you were in a house, which would you be in? And it's crazy how many people think that they are brave and courageous and that they belong in Gryffindor. It was like 50, 60 percent. And then like or maybe even more than that. And then the rest of them were like, no, OK, I guess I'm in the other. Yeah. One. Well, thinking um, about sort of funny. Gryffindors, I think they're a bit arrogant. They're a bit you think like so? we're, we're first. I didn't pick that up when I was reading the, no? the book. No, but I can see that now like looking back on their sort of interactions and things. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think I think it assumes that they think that they're the best. Hmm. They're like Ravenclaw's a little bit more understated. Yeah. Like, hey, I don't I'm I'm smart. I'm interested in things, but I don't need to tell the whole world about yes. it. Yes. Sort of yeah, the Gryffindor's yeah. a bit in your face, I think. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so in British schools, you had these houses. I did. And you were in Howard House, with, and you, you earned points for cup, a trophy? or I think was there the... was a trophy at the end. There was an award ceremony. There was, yeah, a house won at the end of the year. Yes. And actually, every assembly we had, we saw the house points. There was a plaque. Of... <laughs> <laughs> You're jumping up and down. I know. Excitement. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. So Howard, Sheridan, you, you could see who was ahead. And could you lose points based on bad behavior in the classroom or was it mostly mostly based on sporting events and sort of competitions? It was, I think you could only win points. I don't think we got deducted them. Maybe in the previous generations it was a deducting kind of system but i think people have learned that that's not always the best is it i don't know you're the parent right. is that good to reward bad no, positive like bad, yeah positive influences or whatever you call it yeah yeah so <laughs> you had these prefect friends and what and you said head boy head girl what did they do what was their uh, yeah role? they had duties so again similar to the prefects in hogwarts so they they would sort of encourage students to be where they need to be at certain times. There was a very obvious point that we would interact with the prefect every day at the lunch canteen. There was this queue that we had to line up on one side of the corridor and the prefects would always go up and down the line and try and encourage you to queue correctly. And then they That's would why you guys are so you. good at queuing. Yeah. Like forming lines. Oh, you got wow. like you know, they had like a whip out, like get in line yeah. <laughs> or get in the queue, get in the queue, right? Yes. What yes. do you say? Form form a queue or how do you? Say? I rarely use the form term a queue. queue. Uh, yes, form a queue. Yes, that's what they would say. They also say form a line now, so it wouldn't be weird if a non-native came over and said line in England. You would but understand yeah. us. Good. <laughs> All right. That's so funny. Okay, so you had these prefects working. I'm trying to think about what other aspects. So there was the sorting ceremony. You had the house systems, which really, truly, I mean, it just looks like it's truly reflecting the traditions of your guys' boarding schools, which is amazing. There's, go yeah, ahead. But mm-hmm. it, this was my school, and my school was just a state school. So the boarding schools would have been even more similar. Because oh. I had those house, that house structure, and that's just a state school. Okay, and yeah, the hierarchy. How did you say hierarchy when you said it? Yeah, different. I say hierarchy. Hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. okay. I normally say hierarchy. Yeah, we've got the different pronunciation on that. That's intriguing. And then the next would be a British humor and satire, which you guys definitely have a sense of humor. That is for sure, not necessarily always the same as American humor. So 
Uh, do you mind reading number three in my mm -hmm. list? British humor and satire. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rowling infuses the Harry Potter series with British humor and satire, often poking fun at societal norms and institutions. Characters like Fred and George Weasley provide comic relief through their mischievous antics, while the Daily Prophet newspaper satire... Uh, how do you say that word? Satire... No, don't even know. Satirizes? I have no idea, actually. I don't think I've ever said that. I would say create satire or what would yeah. I say? Satirizes? Satirizes. That's interesting. I can't even think... Yeah, Makes I think satire. I just um, heard it. So uh, while the Daily Prophet newspaper satirizes sensational <laughs> daily, while the Daily Prophet newspaper satirizes sensationalist journalism and government propaganda. God, that was a mouthful. So <laughs> satirizes we just discussed. I uh, don't know if we are going to keep this in the edit, but uh, we didn't know how to pronounce that. So, so satire to um, yeah, satirizes. The English is not a phonetic language, and so even native speakers sometimes pronounce words differently, especially, you know, if we're from different countries. So totally reasonable, in my opinion. So what are your thoughts on this? I know it's hard to answer a question, like to read and comprehend what you're reading simultaneously. But the fact that there's comic relief, they have the Daily Prophet, which does the satirizing sensationalist journalism what's your thoughts on this is this similar to real life i think the second thing is more understandable or more relatable the daily prophet using satire because all of the newspapers it's probably not british this but the culture is to use puns and sort of witty sort of phrases here and there to bring the story to life I think people just know of like a, a dad pun being the staple for the front page of a lowbrow newspaper in the UK. That's very, very common. Is it common for, for yours? You know what? I think a lot of people, well, my mom and dad read real newspapers, physical newspapers, but I don't know, honestly. Like I have to think about like, because you have newspapers and then you have all of those magazines, sort of like pop culture magazines, we have a lot of those with a lot of fun phrases on the front like that make you your eyes pop and want to grab the cover and read what's inside. A lot of them recently have been, of course, about Kate Middleton because, you know, she's... I was going to ask if it's about the royal family often because in the, in the UK and in Australia, it's always got the royal family on at least one of those gossip magazines, which baffles me, but still, there we go. That's <laughs> no, but the world I, we live I, in. I think that it's more, obviously more recently with the stuff that's been going on, but I don't remember having much. Yeah, I think Kate Milton, people just like her so much that she, she ends up on the covers of things. But yeah, so there are definitely popping phrases like try to get people attracted, but I'm not sure about newspapers. Yeah, right. Going to the Fred and George Weasley providing comic relief. I felt like theirs was quite slapstick comedy, a bit on your nose, a bit obvious. So it wasn't the humor that I value as British. So I didn't I didn't relate to it in that way. But I thought either that they're just the class clown. And I think most cultures would have a class clown, wouldn't they? Yeah. Definitely. Good, good term. Yeah, that funny person in the classroom that makes themselves noticeable, makes themselves noticeable and yeah, constantly. Often getting in trouble, in my opinion. Yeah, so interesting. So yeah, there is the humor there. Do you have anything else to say about British humor, satire? I didn't see it coming up too much in Harry Potter. I don't know. Did you, did you relate to it as a humorous book? No. I felt like the magic was there. The, there was even a little bit of love. But the main thing was escaping to this completely different universe that is magical. And then obviously the, the drama between Harry and Lord Voldemort. But, yes, uh, and all the, cliff, yeah. all the cliffhangers. 
that made you want to read to the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter until you're up at five in the morning when you're like thir- 12 or 13 years old just trying to yeah, yeah. get it all in I didn't appreciate that. I, I haven't <laughs> appreciated that as an adult. That's exactly what I did. Yeah, it was a real, we say page turner as well, don't we? Page turner. Yeah, good words here. Mm. Yeah. So you read them all. You read them all in one go, sort of. Not like, no, you read when you got one, when you bought one, you read it in one go? Yes. Yes, I was. That, I would say that was the only book that I was good at reading. The rest I was pretty bad at. There was one other novel or like a series of novels that was kind of similar, but no. Yeah, Harry Potter was, yeah, I, I couldn't put it down and then it'd be finished. I actually wasted a few summer holiday, holidays because of it. Like I was taken to a, a sunny place and then I was just in my bedroom reading the whole time. My mom says that to me all the time. We went to Hawaii and you were sitting on the beach reading and you never looked up from your book. So where were you on vacation where your mom (laughs) took Um, a picture of you with your Harry Potter books? I've said this to you before, but Hawaii seems so cool, so exotic for a Brit. We were in probably like a Canary Island off of Africa that is a Spanish one. Really, for us, the Canary Islands are, I mean... I don't want to be disrespectful, but it's just one rock or like, well, there's probably six or seven islands of them, but it just feels like a tiny rock with very little culture. (laughs) Well, grass is always greener, right? Like I always tell Lucas, I'm like, you'd probably go to Hawaii and go, well, Brazilian beaches, you know, warmer water and things, you know. (laughs) Because Hawaii's Hawaii's fantastic, but it's also an island like the Canary Islands. And, you know, when you run out of things to do, you're like, you are supposed to relax. And so if you're not good at relaxing or if, you know, some people truly are not good at relaxing. They want stuff to do and go, go, go. Or if you're not adventurous and want to go out snorkeling and, you know, all of that nature related stuff, then it might leave you, I mean, with much to desire (laughs) yeah 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 needing a new franchise to be placed on your lap in form of a book (laughs) exactly the only other things um i have on here i'm i'm going to read through them we have british folklore and mythology which it says like creatures like unicorns and dragons have roots in british folklore do you learn much about british folklore at school we might have i've forgotten most of it um We did read, I think we read The Hobbit or no. So I was in a lower English class, actually. And I read Of Mice and Men. Oh, yes. I read Of Mice and Men. And the top sets read, I think they read The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Flies? Yeah, I think it was The Lord of the Flies, actually. It was The Lord of the Flies. (laughs) I didn't read it, so I have no idea what's in the book. But They're cannibals. Are they? Yeah, Lord they're the like boys, little boys that live on the, an island and they start eating each other, oh if I remember correctly. Gosh. This was so long ago. But of Mice and Men, too, I thought that that was Lenny was the guy's name, right? Lenny, the, the big... Lenny and George. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was a good book. Yeah, it was really good, actually. People should read uh, that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I thought about the Loch Ness Monster. That could be to do with this, couldn't it? Have you seen the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> I have. Yes. As a child, I really was angry with people because I thought it's obviously just three farm tractor tire tires like on the surface of the water. You idiots. Why do you think it's a Loch Ness monster? So I was really adamant to think that it was just that. But uh, of course, it is real. And there is a real Loch Ness monster lurking in the waters up in Scotland. But um, it does look like tires now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know <laughs> that that relationship didn't occur to me before, but that's funny. Oh, man. So we had. Yeah. OK, so folklore. We had Loch Ness monster, um, social structures and class divisions. OK, so cal- characters like the Malfoy family represent the ar- aristocratic elite. Mm -hmm. While the Weasley family embodies the working class. Do you think there's that's that's fairly realistic? Like there's big divides in society from one class to the next. Is it? Yeah, I I guess that's pretty normal everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, there is 
There is that everywhere. Money mm -hmm. does divide society. But as I've been learning about the history of the great English country houses, I've really appreciated that it's a class-based society, that we've got this hangover from those those houses. So those houses were, I don't know if you know, but they were so grand that they would employ maybe 30 to 50 people to keep the houses running from the, the grounds to the catering to the cleaning, everything. So uh, these noblemen, and it's, it's through the feudal system where these kings would give, no, uh, they would class them as noble people because they would do well in battles. And then their sons and their sons and their sons would pass down these rights to these big houses and through no reason they would have this upper sort of societal expectation on their heads uh, to run these huge houses so they would be forced into this position and then the people that would work for them would be the working class and and they kind of moved into the cities when the industrial revolution happened but I'm there's still this hangover of those people that had those great English country houses. Like my parents, so my dad, his mum was part of a great English country house. So she grew up with servants. And then my my mum's side was not the opposite, but like, you know, so it's only three generations away from modern day Britain that we're still part of this. And and you know, if some of them are still hanging on, some of these great great English country houses. So So you're saying if we go to England, you're gonna host us at your big English country estate? <laughs> no, that that got no. sold as soon as my great auntie died and then split up and given to a farm. Well they they were they're really expensive. You've probably seen some shows on Netflix, but they're really, really expensive to keep running. And as soon as labor costs went up, it kind of made it pointless. And it was actually to do with America. The the grain that you guys managed to create at such a cheaper rate, it caused problems for the... For the farm? For the farms, yeah. Oh, no way. That's mm. crazy. So is it sort of like the what we would also see... Now, I'm, I'm going to keep referencing films and shows because I do think that we're finding out the realistic. Downton Abbey and you have like Jane... Bridgerton. Jane Bridger, Bridger, Bridgerton. And then also like... I know that Jane Austen was from Bath, right? Yeah, I don't remember, but probably. I believe she was yeah. from Bath. But around there, there's also like sort of the countryside and things. So these houses, the ones that we see in these shows, that's really owned by private families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Passed down through the generations. Yeah, absolutely. So and the one that they film Bridgerton in and I think even Downton Abbey, that is... I think it's the Crimson. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, that is still run by the family. A portion of it they live in. That is yeah. wild. So do you back watch to those the shows? Sorry, um, do you watch those shows? Bridgerton and... No, I don't actually. I find period dramas really annoying. I don't know what... <laughs> I don't know why. The costumes just annoy me for some reason. Oh, I love Very the offensive. costumes. That's yeah. so funny. I, th yeah. I and you know what it is I had two I have two sisters so when I was growing up and they were older than me they would always have Jane Eyre on and I found it so boring I just wanted to watch cartoons or something so oh, no. I felt like it so was you forced like on a, me you d you didn't enjoy Pride and Prejudice and God no I hated that absolutely hated that ah yeah. that's crazy <laughs> sorry I just Darcy you got it you gotta love it it's, it's I just it's, it's too good so you're anyway, a big fan yeah i actually watched pride and prejudice recently and jane Eyre. i also really enjoy it. it's all sort of the same vibe you know yeah but i just i just want to bring it back to harry potter and the everyday class based system so obviously we don't have those great english country houses in most cities and the average person doesn't have any interaction with that but a very quick easy pop cultural reference on tiktok there's this theme of going up to somebody in america and saying in a sports car and saying what job do you do and they very proudly say what job they have like their profession right they're really proud of what they did and they achieved the american dream in the uk that wouldn't land 
well at all. That would be really, really rude. It would be showing off. It would be potentially money that they didn't earn because they inherited it. I think that's the difference. American dream, you can make your money, you can do what you want. In England, there's a lot of hangover of the class-based system. I love that. That's actually a super important cultural snippet because, you know, when we travel there, I mean, I think in general, it's not really nice to ask, you know, what somebody does because it puts them in this like situation where they go, they have to go, oh, if it's embarrassing, you know, I'm not financially okay or this or that. But yeah, Lindsay was actually telling me um, from All Ears English, like people there in Colorado do not ask it. It's always, what do you do for fun? And it Ah. says it's a better gauge of someone's characteristic, their personality, and like easier way to start a conversation with them, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been in, you've you've spent some time in France. Apparently they do this. Oh, they do the same thing? Well, they just don't focus on work being part of your conversation. I don't, I don't know if that's true. I've heard that from French people. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I don't think I've spent enough time, but that's right. that's also interesting. They it sounds I know that France also has this class class based society. I used to date someone that was in the French upper class, which is I kind really of, yeah kind oh. of a castle situation, which was really had a castle. They had a castle. Yeah. Well, so anyway, it was it was just <laughs> very. <laughs> Very cool, I have to say. Big surprise, but he would always talk about there's definitely a division in class in France. And I and I remember thinking, like, what? Like, really? I don't really understand. He's like, no, 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 because he was studying abroad in the United States, so he can compare. Anyway, off topic, totally. But it's interesting to, yeah, that is. to reflect I, on I, I, I would like to just clarify, my, my father got no inheritance, so um, we're not loaded. because And, and that's another thing. I think people feel awkward if they're rich in England, in the, in, the great, in the UK. I think in America, you have a different, a more positive attitude towards it, right? Yeah, there's more showiness, I think, okay. with the money. So I think it could become a norm. But I, I also, yeah, I don't want to go too much into it. There's personality differences. I find that a lot of people that are really successful, they're not the showy ones. And the ones that are like, you know, barely made it. Like, they're like, look at all the stuff I got, you know, like, it's a very, anyway, I think we've covered most of the things that I have in my list. We talked about the schooling system. We talked about landscape and architecture, humor, briefly folklore, not too much, but social structure, traditions and holidays. I think we kind of bring it to a close with this because you talked about the Great Hall before, the beautiful there's a beautiful long table with all of the foods do you guys have the things that they talk about in the book do you remember some of the the meals that they eat because this for me was like what is this i don't know what it is like figgy i think what what was it treacle pudding was one of them treacle pudding yes that's a real thing Uh treacle pudding yeah i like treacle pudding treacle sponge pudding i think it is yeah Okay, and that's like yeah. sort of molasses, right? Isn't I, I under from what I understood, yeah, treacle is molasses, isn't it? Like this sort of heavy black, really thick consistency. The treacle pudding I know of is more sort of lighter colored. It's like golden syrupy kind of color. But yeah, I'm. I mean, I know we did an episode on British desserts, so we could reference that. But I'm a bit of a doofus when it comes to British. Uh, when it comes to food in general, I'm not I'm not the most yeah, knowledgeable. Gotcha. So just in general, the foods and like the, these big events, are they real? Like, do you feel like you were watching like the holidays and the sporting events and you were like, yes, this is normal for me. Obviously, you guys aren't flying on broomsticks. <laughs> You're not playing Quidditch. But is there some realism in the, the visuals that you got? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I when Quidditch was on, that was just so good. So good, wasn't it, when they were flying around? I really, really wanted to be part of that. I guess, so going back to the food, roast dinners, that would be quite a, a similar thing, right? We would eat a lot more roast dinners than you guys, so I can kind of see it. It felt like they were always overdoing it. I felt a bit full and stuffed when I was reading these parts where they would go to the banquets and have the feasts halloween and stuff it was yummy i suppose but the sporting 
rugby, football, cricket, are they a bit more like Quidditch than your American football, uh, hockey? What else is big for you? What are the th- four big ones? American football, basketball, no. baseball. Basketball. baseball, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was Americans that instigated it, but there is now Quidditch. Like, there's actually a sport. How? Yeah, I know. They're, they're not flying, but it's, um, it's kind of like... <laughs> You should Google it. It's really funny. Okay, yeah. They, it, it's kind of like hockey mixed with rugby mixed with maybe football. Oh, no, I Ultimate like Frisbee. Ultimate Frisbee. That's what I was about to say. Do you know that? Well, I cannot. Sport? I do know that sport. I like that sport, and I cannot picture this combination in my head. It's not working. And they actually have a broomstick between their legs. It's really funny. This is up there with the uh, cheese competition and. <laughs> <laughs> where what's the city name we talked about it in your episode that we just yeah the, the cheese rolling happens in the cotswolds so you could experience a, a quaint village it's in cooper's hill in oh god i can't remember the area well cotswold the cotswolds is is the area amazing so i'm gonna wrap up this episode but i think that everybody needs to read harry potter especially even as a book being in a foreign language. So reading it in English for a non-native speaker, I think would be extremely beneficial, not just because it, there's the pop culture aspect. And most people, I think a lot of people can talk about Harry Potter. It's something to relate to someone else on. And I don't know, I think there's a lot of other reasons to read Harry Potter. Um, do you have any other ideas for why it would be valuable for a non-native speaker to read the books? I mean, if they've already read them in their language, they're probably like us and they're probably absolute nerds and they know the story inside out. So it'd be a really good tool to learn in to read in English because they know the plot. They know the comprehension behind it. So it's a very useful way to mirror the translations, I guess. Also, the way that she writes is just so understandable it's so clear yet also quite colorful with the adjectives that she uses it's it's great so true i love that great i don't have anything else i want to share i think we covered so much just remember yeah if you do read harry potter it's a lot of it is real charlie just shared a thousand things that are like real life in england i i'm knocking this off my bucket list to talk to a british person about about Harry Potter. So thank you so much. Is there anything Pleasure. else you want to say? You- I do I do want to promote Harry Potter World. Um, I'm not affiliated, sadly, but it was a good day out. I really encourage people to go to London and visit that. The, um, the most impressive part was the Gringotts Bank. That was, that was really cool. You know that scene where he's walking along with the... Um, goblins. And- goblins, yeah. That was one of the most impressive parts of the day. So people dressed as goblins or? Well, there were goblins behind the, the, ca- the cashier sort of stools, but just this, the scene itself was very grand. It made me feel like I was, I mean, I am, but it made me feel even more like I was Harry because you're walking along, you feel very small and intimidated by it all. Yeah, you feel like you're there in the moment. Oh, I love that. Okay, so Harry Potter world. When you're in London, is it in Mm -hmm. London? It is. It's in Watford, which is just outside of London. Gotcha. And if you're in the United States, go to WB Studios. It's not nearly going to be as good as what you guys have there, but it's definitely a taste of of Harry Potter. (laughs) So, yeah, I I wonder. Sorry, Shana. I wonder the equivalent. We should we should go to each other's and see the comparisons. I always. I never want to go, I don't know, how do I say this? Europe is going to do things better than the United States in terms of architecture and the way things look, because you already have castles to compare stuff to. Like you already have all the stuff in regular life looks great. So to be impressive, you have to take it to the next level. Whereas in the United States, we don't have castles. We don't have all this stuff. So it's like, if you do like the bare minimum, it's like, wow, this is so exciting. Uh, Um, That's a very good point impression yeah no that that makes sense but yeah, we can still I, do that yeah let's swap <laughs> <laughs> feel like i'm getting the raw end of the deal here but yeah. uh yeah i'm up for it 
Thank you very much, Shana. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.